Hey everyone, I'm Michael Tomaski. This is Tomaski Cast for the New Republic, and I'm really delighted to be joined uh, right now by filmmaker Ken Burns, the illustrious filmmaker Ken Burns, uh, who has looked into jazz and baseball and the Civil War and so many other things. And his new subject is Muhammad Ali, uh, uh, a film, a four-part film that will start airing next week. Uh, where, by the way, Ken? It's, uh, it's actually September 19th, uh, 20th, 21st, and 22nd on PBS, as always, as, okay. as it has been for the last 40 plus years, and uh, obviously available for streaming as well on the 19th. That's great. Well, thank you again for joining us. And so, Muhammad Ali, uh, a subject about whom I have read and watched many, many things, so I'm really excited about this conversation. Uh, okay, so first question is an obvious one. Um, why did you choose him a as your subject? Well, let me speak with the plural and not royal we, um, not pretentiously, but because this is co-directed by Sarah Burns, my oldest daughter, and her husband, David McMahon. We've collaborated on the Central Park Five and Jackie Robinson and are working on other films together, one of four producing strains, uh, producing teams that I work with. Uh, we're just drawn to the man. I mean, this is the greatest athlete of the 20th century. I make a compelling argument that he's the greatest athlete of all times. He intersects with almost all of the important issues of the second half of the 20th century from sports and the role of sports in society and the role of black athletes in society. And then, of course, race and faith and religion and politics and war. And I think as we delve into a personal life, we can engage uh, ideas of 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 sex and fidelity and, and things like that. And these are things that we're talking about to this day. Um, so, you know, he's one of the most compelling. I, I can think of maybe a handful of other human beings in American life that are as central to who we are and reflect us back to ourselves so spectacularly in such epic fashion. So Louis Armstrong, uh, a, a, an Abraham Lincoln, a Harriet Tubman, a Ida B. Wells, a Franklin Roosevelt, a, a Benjamin Franklin, you know, these are kind of central figures of us, uh, both the U.S. and us in a kind of intimate uh, way. Now, there are, have been many, many, many films made about Muhammad Ali, films I adore and love, and wouldn't think for a second that our job was to replace them. We're interested in a much more comprehensive portrait. Those films are often about a particular fight or a series of fights or a, a fight with the United States government. This is soup to nuts. This is, you know, uh, birth and boyhood in segregated Jim Crow, uh, Louisville, Kentucky, to death by Parkinson's just five years ago, not that long ago, 2016. Yeah. And all that went in between. We're interested in the fights and you get in-depth knowledge, even if you're not a, a boxing aficionado, which I am not, though this is my second film on boxing after Jack Johnson, but you get an insight of about 20 of the important fights and understand their interiors. We have a secret weapon, the former heavyweight champion, Michael Bent, who sort of tells you not just the strategy and tactics, which may appeal to the sports fan, but the kind of psychology and the drama and the ebb and flow between and, and, and within the rounds and what's happening in the various corners in a way that's, that's intimate and important important, but no less important is not a fixed, but a continuing spiritual journey that begins with his attraction to the nation of Islam in a, in a record he hears as a young man um, read by Louis Farrakhan, uh, Minister X, and, um, and then and see it as a process, not just something that's named, and see the dynamics of the struggle with the United States. This is one of the most valuable people who's sort of insulting um, America, he gets three strikes against him. The first is he's a loud, bragging athlete. And athletes aren't supposed to be like that. And certainly black athletes are supposed to know their place and not be uh, that way. And he was that way and unashamedly that way. Strike one. Uh, he then, after he defeats Liston, announces that he is a member of the Nation of Islam, which has been labeled by what we call mainstream media as a hate group. And that's strike two. 
And then, of course, he refuses induction into the draft, and that's strike three, you're out. And that compels a lot of the stories, but I think we tend to thus treat it in that superficial way. So what I'm interested in is all the moments of reflection and wisdom that come amidst the poetry and the braggadocio. We are interested in that. We're yeah, interested yeah. in how that spiritual journey evolves. We're interested in the contours of the fights and the interiors of the fights and who the opponents are and who's rooting for whom and the way in which certain segments of the society are alienated or then maybe are won back to him for a variety of reasons. So there's a kind of, this is a multi-year process. I said yes to this in 2013. We began work in 2014. And here we are at the end of 2021, wow. feeling confident enough to say, we can share this four-part, eight-hour film with you. Talk about that moment, that pivotal moment, February of 1964, a very interesting month in terms of cultural earthquake, also the month that the Beatles first came to America, and you do show some footage of <laughs> Clay horsing around with the Beatles at his gym in Miami, which is interesting. Uh, but uh, Clay, as he was known then. Right, he's um, not yet Muhammad yeah, Ali. Right, so uh, he beats Sonny Liston, uh, big upset, I think Liston was an eight to one favorite, something like that. He becomes the world heavyweight champion. I believe it's the very next day he announces that he is, uh, has become, is becoming uh, uh, a black Muslim. Um, tell people, younger people in particular, like what that had to be like for the United States of America. I mean, the boxing heavyweight champion was a much bigger deal in those days. And for him to announce that, just, just set that scene for, for people today. From the late uh, 19th century up until uh, Muhammad Ali and maybe a little bit beyond with Mike Tyson and some of the dramas there, the heavyweight champion was a very, very important thing. I, I've asked now sports writers who've interviewed me in our press tour uh, who to name the heavyweight champion and no one has yet been able to name the heavyweight champion right now and I don't know and I don't care. The thing is, is that this guy was so compelling and so um, magnetic and charismatic and confident and funny and and everything and yet he also wasn't the way the stereotypical fighter was he was protected by a lower middle class upbringing still segregated society still influenced by the brutal murder of Emmett Till still under the the thrall of his father's anger and disappointment but he's not behaving the way he's supposed to behave and so this is people are going into this confident, not only that Liston is going to win, but that um, they're gonna, he's gonna shut him up because this is, Liston is the familiar figure, as thuggish as he was at times and connected to the mob and, and learned how to box in jail for armed robbery, I, I believe it, it was. Mm -hmm. So you've got this contrast of an emerging new black consciousness, a guy who's defining black masculinity in a way Jackie Robinson had a decade, a generation before. It's now, it's different and it's not kowtowing in any way to anybody but his own drive for freedom, much like Jack Johnson, but this time he wants freedom for everybody. So there's something radical and threatening about him. And then the next morning, he's saying, as Robert Lipside and, and, and uh, Dave Kindred and Jerry Eisenberg are among the then cub reporters who are now old men talking about, you know, what they remember about this amazing thing is that he says something, Lipside says, he goes, I don't have to be who, who, who you want me to be. I can be who I want. We actually hear Cassius Clay say that. And, and Lipside said that sounded to us like a declaration, an athletic declaration of independence, the likes of which we hadn't heard. And then come to find out, as we say here in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. um, he's joined this separatist, radical cult called the Nation of Islam, which bears very little real resemblance to Islam, the, the mainstream religion, but has enough of its tenets to, to be called that and has been attractive to people frustrated with the slow pace of change of the Southern Christian agrarian civil rights movement. So all of a sudden he's now threatening on multiple levels and it, begun, it begins to create the same fear that Jack Johnson created when all of the previous heavyweight champions up until 1906-7 are, are white people and that's the way it is, noblesse oblige, the white man's burdens, and suddenly this black man comes on and he's confident, he's outspoken, he's sleeping with whomever he wants, white and black, 
and suddenly the world says, we need a great white hope to defeat him, and they couldn't find one. In a way, there's a similar kind of response. This cannot pass. And so what you begin to see unfold over the next, um, you know, decade until he regains his title, I mean, he's, he's, he fights many fights and retains his title, is just how unbelievably polarizing, and people like to say divisive. For many of us, we loved hearing this. You know, I grew up you know, on a college campus and my dad in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and the first teaching was held there in the anthropology department. He was an anthropologist, and when Muhammad Ali refused induction into the draft later on, this was not a divisive moment for us. This was like right on. Yeah. Talk a bit also about um, his relationships with Elijah Muhammad, who was uh, the head of, of the Nation of Islam and Malcolm X, uh, and that was complicated and, you know, not necessarily Ali's best decision in his life, no. best moment, uh, one he later came to rue quite greatly. Yes, so, you know, uh, a good story allows the warts and all, and we're unafraid of telling you, you know, his, his treatment of Joe Frazier using the language of a white racist is inexcusable, and many other of his opponents, his infidelity is, is just legendary uh, uh, among his, at least three of his, his four wives, and, and I think his, his betrayal, if you will, or his moving away from Malcolm X is an interesting story. So in many ways, Elijah Muhammad, who is the head of this group called the Nation of Islam, controls a good deal of his life. And he, though sports is frowned on by the Nation of Islam, is frivolous, they can't kind of ignore this wonderful pr promoting guy who loves them. And so it's it's a very interesting dance that they're doing and in fact in their mag in their newspaper they print after he beats nobody thinks he's going to beat Liston and when he does they print extra pages to talk about the fight he's one of them it's 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 a very important thing and i think in a way elijah muhammad becomes a kind of surrogate father figure whether where his father had reached a dead end and was frustrated that they weren't treating him like the painter that he was he could only paint signs yeah. and and seemed to embody the 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 black man who had been beaten down by the system, he, uh, on the other hand, seemed to have achieved this separateness and this richness and this sort of vitality and control and power, which were attractive and meaningful in a spiritual way, but I think in a very practical way. So Elijah Muhammad exerts a lot of control. He develops a friendship, a real intimate friendship with Malcolm X, who's one of the most outspoken ministers. But Malcolm X is himself leaning towards a kind of political expression in a way the Nation of Islam doesn't, and he's also threatening them because he knows the internal corruption and he knows also uh, he's a threat to them because he's popular yeah. and people are paying attention to him so he's he makes an intemperate remark about the assassination of JFK chickens coming home to roost he's right. suspended and then permanently exiled he begins to speak publicly about the corruption of the nation of Islam um, Ma uh, Muhammad Ali is ordered to separate from him which he does dutifully and subsequently, as we all know, Malcolm X is assassinated and assassinated by members of the Nation of Islam. So you could also look at this 21-year-old, 22-year-old kid and go, he understood the danger he would have been in if he had aligned himself with Malcolm X. But I think it's also... Elijah Muhammad had given him this new name, given him this new identity, empowered him in a way internally that that he had to, I think, go that way. And then later on, he understood that the more ecumenical and, and mainstream version of Islam that Malcolm X embraced in the last years of his life after his visit to Mac uh, Mecca was what Wallace Muhammad, the, the, the son of Elijah Muhammad, preaches when his father eventually dies, and what Muhammad Ali has always felt. There's a wonderful uh, statement in the film by one of his white benefactors in Louisville when a British reporter says, you know, but you white Christian men, you know, this guy is a, a, is a Muslim, a hate group. And he said, if it's a hate group, he can't be a member because there's not a hateful bone in his body. And that brings me back to the reference to the Beatles and the cultural moment that you said, Michael, which is he is at a... Uh, this important point, the British invasion has taken place, the Beatles visit the second floor of the Fifth Street gym, and there's a stage shot of him knocking him down, all that fooling around. But it just occurred to me that here are five men who understood what it was really about, how the universe really works. And all five of them, uh, 
Muhammad Ali, Cassius Clay, soon to be Muhammad Ali, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, George Harrison, and Ringo Starr, best exemplified by a line of Paul McCartney's, which, and in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. And so you have avatars of what how the universe works right there in that room fooling around but who are going to practice what they preach for the rest of their lives now three of them are gone Muhammad Ali and John Lennon and George Harrison but the two remaining are still avatars of that particular point of view and I think you know while the FCC allows me to say the four-letter word love nobody wants to talk about it every time I, I do it a reporter moves on to another <laughs> question but this man is he dies the most beloved person on the planet yeah and we need to investigate why that happened yeah most beloved most popular best known person on per, the planet probably. on the planet you know yeah. I just finished a film the last film was on on um on Ernest Hemingway, you know, that yeah. dies a lonely death, a self-inflicted yeah. shotgun blast. Do not try this at home. Uh, arguably the greatest writer of the 20th century and with four wives. And here's a guy with four wives, not arguably the greatest athlete of the 20th century. And he dies not that long ago, the most beloved person on the planet. Yeah. Don't you want to know why? I think our film is, is, is in, in its edges. It's not overtly. It's not it's not holding up a neon sign, Michael. It's just saying yeah. you can find in the intervals of the music of this film something about that love and something about that extraordinary human being that we call Muhammad Ali. Amazing. Uh, a lot I want to cover, but um, let's just very quickly about him as a fighter. Because watching the documentary reminded me, uh, I haven't watched those clips of his fights from 1965 66 and into early 67 when he was no longer allowed to fight but you watch him fight those people and there's never been probably a, an athlete in an individual sport who was so toweringly heads and shoulders above everybody else in the sport nobody could touch him yeah it's just like jack johnson only more so because he's so attractive and and lovable this he's doing everything wrong and thank god he didn't go with rg moore he left rg moore's sort of rigorous training camp and ended up with angelo dundee who's who understood like the principal thing if you're a boxer is you don't keep your hands your fist down cassius k kept his fist down you don't lean backwards to duck a punch you get killed that way you duck you know you duck like that he he does all of this stuff and he does it so magnificently and he's dancing and he's prancing. There's a joie de vivre and there's this, this sense that this is the ultimate boxer. So Michael Bent says of a, of a, a relatively short fight, three rounds, I think it was with Cleveland, big cat Williams, who was, yeah. you know, interestingly enough, a black man shot by a policeman from a, a right. drunk driving stop uh, is his masterpiece. He says his Barishnikov, his Picasso, his Miles Davis. And it, and it really is. It's like, no one could touch him. No one could touch him. And because he had become this polarizing figure, you find other black boxers who are beginning to play into that, who are refusing to call him Muhammad Ali, calling him Cassius Clay. Terrell is the most famous person. And what he does to Terrell is, is rather cruel and brutal on the surface, but really about what it, the transformation that is taking place around the United States and around the world in terms of empowerment. And Muhammad Ali embodies this. He's saying to him as he is delivering a whooping, what's my name? Yeah. What's my name? I mean, these are masterpieces, Zora Foley, which we don't do, we reference, but we don't do so much because it's at the time he's now, his, his draft uh, classification has been changed to 1A. Uh, and then of course that sends into another drama and going on. And then, you know, as, as you know, the Liston fight, the original Liston fight is great. And then you've got the three Frasers, which are believe. And then I, I think in some ways the masterpiece of all masterpieces, and that's the, um, the fight in Kinshasa Zaire in 1974, yeah. in which he reclaims the championship from a George Foreman who was supposed to be even more formidable and demolish him. In fact, people in his corner were worried about whether he'd actually live through the fight. He was that advanced in age, lost three and a half years of the prime of his career. Yeah. And his what he does to George Foreman, you know, it, it can bring tears to your eyes because 
unlike Jack Johnson, he's not just doing it for himself. I mean, he is, and he's very much an egotist, and he loves the way he looks. I'm as pretty as a girl, you know, and he's showing off his, but it's for everybody who's ever felt that the man had their boot on their, on their neck, and that's, you know, this oh, is I, I, Yeah, I remember very well the predictions that Ollie might not make it out of the ring alive. I was a yeah. teen young teenager cheering for him at the time, and I remember those. We were in college, time. Michael, and, <laughs> and somehow we got a bootleg at Hampshire College. We got a bootleg, a 16 millimeter print, not of anything between rounds, mm -hmm. but just the actual fighting. And we watched it over and oh, over again, God. and you'd see the punch of Foreman and all the sweat going off in 360 degrees uh, in a slow motion version. I, I tried to find that footage that we had. We've got great footage of the fight, but I remember we cheered about it and none of us gave a damn about boxing. We gave a damn about him. And yeah. it was just, we, we learned about boxing. We cared about the dynamics and the interiors, the mysterious and mystical interiors of that fight. And, and, you know, and then went on with our lives, but it was Muhammad Ali. He was our guy. Now, by this time, the early to mid 1970s, he's not quite revered in the way he was in old age, but but he's popular now, I would say, and he's respected. Yeah. And the New York Times is finally calling him Muhammad Ali instead exactly. of Cassius Clay. So talk a bit about that cultural transformation and how well, he became, you know, how he went from being this reviled figure by much of white America to someone who was accepted. You know, respected. it begins, it begins interestingly enough, I believe in his exile, right? That he's maintaining this. I mean, he could, you know, everybody knows he could have been at USO shows, you know, sparring with people and fake punching like the Beatles with stuff and yeah. wasn't going to be in harm's way. And he said, no. So there's a little bit of this sense that the themes that I, of, of the late 20th century that I engaged aren't as important as the two other things, freedom, and then I would say courage and love as well. You know, that the, the, he wanted to be free and 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 he wanted to be himself and he did that so when he gets back he has a couple fights which he wins and when he comes back um in in his road up and then he fights joe frazier for what is supposed to be the championship and he loses and he loses pretty convincingly and he's down on points trying to score a knockout desperately in the last round gets knocked down himself yeah. gets up and then he's the next day he is this thoughtful wise person again you know that is just spectacular, which he does periodically the day after the listen fight, when the Supreme Court absolves him and people are asking him to celebrate and he's going, no, he says, I don't know who's going to be assassinated tonight. I don't know who's going to be deprived. He's thinking yeah. of George Floyd and he's thinking of Breonna Taylor, who we haven't happened yet. He's thinking of Emmett Till and, and 402 years of all of this treatment of black people on this continent. So I think there's a sense, as Lipsight says it really well, Joe Frazier won the fight, but Muhammad Ali won America. And his biographer, Jonathan Ike, said, you know, that's at the time when teenagers like you and him, Jonathan Ike, started putting up his poster there. He'd lost, but he'd done it valiantly. He'd come back. And then the rest of this thing is just fairy tale and Shakespearean tragedy. Fairy tale in that he reclaims his title twice and just Shakespearean tragedy because he doesn't know when to stop. And, um, you're you're by 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 the time at least in our film you're so invested in him you agree with his daughters who are saying daddy don't do it anymore and you feel like you want to say daddy don't do this anymore yeah i remember watching that larry holmes fight on closed circuit tv I, that was from late in his career and uh he couldn't throw a punch and um you know, it, it, it's just, um, you know, he was obviously maybe in the early stages of Parkinson's at that point. I, 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 I think he definitely was. People yeah. were noticing it as far back as the um, the the Frazier fights, the the first, I mean, the third one for sure. He was slower afterwards in, in the news conference. Um, and people were beginning to worry and, and insiders and friends were beginning to to notice the beginning of the the, the shake yeah. the the palsy that it accompanies this crippling disease there's an interesting thing you remember michael j fox the great actor canadian actor yeah. uh who um who has parkinson's and he said an amazing thing that really struck me and i remembered it as we were editing the film he said something publicly in the late 90s i guess um he said i couldn't be still until I couldn't be still. Yeah. It's just a beautiful thing. And yeah. 
in some ways, I think Muhammad Ali, this most valuable of talkers, this great, compelling speaker and poetry spewer and just, you know, outrageously compelling, you know, uber American, couldn't really speak until he couldn't speak. And then after he spoke, it seemed like it was almost exponential growth of that love and, yeah. and, and popularity. You know, I thought I, I, I pressed play on part four, which is the part that covers the decline in the last years of his life, thinking that I wasn't going to like this as much as the others. In many ways, Ken, I found that to be the most moving of the four installments. And, and I thought, you know, you really showed a side of him as an older person that I didn't know as well as, as I thought I did. Uh, someone who, first of all, converted to Islam. Uh, and became very devoutly religious, and apparently became really um, remorseful about some of the earlier cruelties in his life, the cruelty toward Joe Frazier, yes. which he was felt- awful, and the cruelty toward his wives and, and women in general. So he really lived a repentant life in these yes. later years, right? That's where I think he, you know, when he couldn't speak, he, he spoke even louder. He yeah. felt as Jonathan Igg, his biographer, says in the film, that there was a tallying angel that was weighing the sins against the good things. He'd always been generous. He'd always been loving and caring. But, you know, here he knew he had these black marks against him. He had these, you know, uh, he would he would yell at me for saying black marks, right? Because everything that's bad right. is black, he'd said, you know. Right. The white tornado. The white <laughs> tornado. Who's ever seen a white tornado? Black male. White people do black male. Um, he he worried about the infidelity. He said, I fit my religion to fit my lifestyle and not the other way around. And he he was worried about abandoning Malcolm X and realized that he had been, as he said, right about so many things. And he apologized to Joe Frazier, who by this time was so angry and and upset at his... um, at his treatment that he couldn't forgive him and understandable. But I, but yes, he made the efforts to atone in ways publicly that so few of us actually do. We may be aware of them in the deepest recesses of our conversation and self-honesty, but it's hard even with the people next to us to be able to admit these features of ours that are so debilitating. He's out there, you know, for the whole world to see. Uh, culminating, of course, in the moment in Atlanta, which, uh, again, I remember watching. Uh, nobody knew that uh, that young woman was going to be handing the torch to him. That's exactly right. Everyone thought Janet Evans, the swimmer, the Olympic swimmer, was going to light the torch. Dick Ebersole had had the idea and had to you know, swim upstream against resistance in NBC and NBC Sports about it. And then there's just the practical worries. Would this person suffering from Parkinson's want to do it? Initially, Ali said no, but his friend Howard Bingham, the photographer, said, look, there are a billion people. It's a way to show the love. And that's exactly what happened. He came out. Everybody could see the ravages of disease. But then it was that courage to come out there naked, which is the act of boxing, is it not? The least amount of clothing of any sport, uh, there in a ring, and there's a kind of elemental, as as horrible as boxing is, as brutal as it is, um, there's an elemental uh, aspect to it that I think draws us in in, in interesting ways. And so we have a really... um, uh, cathartic moment as Americans. I remember sitting on my couch here in my house here in New Hampshire and just weeping with my daughters, you know, and um, it just, you know, it was unfair. He was as, as you know, uh, Dave Kindred, who adored him and wished to stop fights that he did, just said, you know, it was just so it was so raw and exposed and, and it just revealed to the world he's going to live a long time, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in my Remaining couple of moments here, I'd like to talk, uh, let you talk a little bit about the making of the documentary. Um, uh, you mentioned Michael Bent, uh, the former boxer who, whom you used as a talking head. He was amazing. He, he just added so much texture and insight. You had a lot of other interesting people too, Walter Mosley, Salim Mouakil, the journalist whose work I'm familiar with. Talk about some of the other people who, whom you interspersed into this and what value you thought they brought. Well, I, I think, you know, it's, you want to have a variety of perspectives. You want to not herd him into any place, but you want to see him. You want to talk to his, his brother. 
You want to talk to two of the four wives. You want to talk to two daughters, Hannah and Rashida. You want to talk to the journalists who were themselves young pups like Lipsight and Kindred and Eisenberg. You want to talk to poets, you know, Nikki Giovanni and and Wally Salinka. Yeah, well, you want to talk to to uh, Walter Mosley and and you want to talk to biographers like David Remnick and and Jonathan Ogg. You want to talk to scholars like Gerald Early and Sherman Jackson and uh, Todd Boyd and and you want to talk to the friends that in from Louisville and the friends in the boxing world and the hangers on and 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 people that were in his life to see it from the multiplicity of perspectives that allows you to not just sort of say here's what you should know about him but share with you a process of discovery that these people helped you to have and that all of them collectively Salim is hugely important to the film because he is helping to interpret those of us who carry a kind of superficial baggage about the civil rights movement of how complex it is it, black yeah. people don't think alike nobody thinks alike no. and you can't push them as we always want to do for convenience or, or or for racism into one little box all people are this way that is not the case you know finally you know I've said this a million times and it's maybe boring but I I've been making films about the US for 45 years, but I've also been making films about us. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've understood, Michael, is that there's only us and there's no them. And whenever anybody tells you there's a them, run away. And unfortunately, everything that's happening in our world is, is saying that. My last little question. Uh, I'm not a filmmaker, of course, but I'm a writer and editor, so I know what it's like to have to leave things out. Is there one clip that made you go, oh, I hate to leave this one on the cutting room floor? Hundreds of them. And yeah. what happens is you learn a kind of discipline and a kind of ferocity in which you don't care and you don't, you don't, after the film is locked, they're out of your mind. So this is not an additive process. You don't build a film the way you build a house unless you bring to the construction site 50 times or 60 times as much material as you need to build this house. This is subtractive. We collected, we have an eight hour film. We have hundreds of hours of footage that we looked at, hundreds of uh, hours of interview. We have thousands and thousands of photographs. All of that is great. And that's you know a hugely important thing. And then you kind of distill it. Maybe the Kentucky thing. Up here we make maple syrup and you evaporate off the 40 gallons of sap till you've left with a gallon of syrup. But maybe the distillation of Kentucky bourbon uh, because he's from Louisville is more appropriate. And so you learn a kind of steely eye. The opening of our film, which is a wonderful thing of him stealing cornflakes from his daughter Miriam, was yeah. comfortably and perfectly placed in the third of the fourth episodes. And nobody would have touched it. And I just thought, you know what? We know all the stuff in the introduction, but why don't we throw a curve and give him what everybody knows, what it's like to steal from your kid's plate in a playful, joyous, loving way. And yeah. it helps set the tone of the film. And then we yeah. found something to make the, the absence in that place better. But yeah, lots of stuff is left out. The cutting room floor is not filled with bad stuff. It's right. filled with great stuff, which if I showed you, you'd say, you're an idiot. And I have to go back and say, well, we took it out because it destabilized this in this way, or it was yeah. too many notes or it was some other such thing and sure. it's a great process and Sarah and Dave Sarah Burns and David McMahon the co-directors who are also the writers and this small nucleus there are hundreds of people in our credits deservedly so but this is handmade by by four sure. editors and a couple of assistants and and some co-producers Stephanie Jenkins and others Tim McAleer I mean just people who dedicated themselves to finding this material and so we can say it's usually meaningless when you say it. There's new and never before, rare and never. But it doesn't matter if that's true if you don't use it in the service of of a good story. And I think that's what we've we've done. And um, I'm so excited to share it. Say one more time the name of it and when and where people can see it. Um, having buried the lead for a good number of times, uh, PBS, the Public Broadcasting service is broadcasting our four-part eight-hour film called Muhammad Ali starting September 19th on PBS. Check local listings available for streaming at the same time. Ken Burns, thank you so much. Really a pleasure. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.